So the topic we're on is how do we distribute keys and we're up to the part of how do we distribute public keys. The challenge is that with public key cryptography we want to tell everyone else or the idea is to, just, to tell everyone else what your public key is. The problem with that is that when you how do you inform someone of your public key and the person who receives it needs to be sure that it actually came from you and not from someone else. So when I post a public key on my website and you download and use that public key, how are you sure that it is in fact my public key and it's not someone else who has got access to the website and posted a public key? So how do we distribute public keys? And <clears throat> what we said there are different approaches and we said okay first approach just make some public announcement post your key on a website in the bottom of your email print it in a newspaper whatever but again the problem here is that we're not sure that this public key is for the person that they say it is it could be someone pretending that it's Steve's public key when it's in fact someone else's Another approach is that we have some directory, some computer, some server where the users of the system go to that directory and publish their public key. Okay, so each user goes to the directory and provides some ID, some physical ID. They go to the person who runs the directory, show some ID and say this is my public key. The person who runs the directory confirms, okay, this person is in fact who they say they are. And when you want some other user's public key, A publishes its public key in the directory, B publishes its public key in the directory. When A wants B's public key, then A contacts the directory and downloads B's public key. So that's the general approach of using some central server or directory to store. Of course, if we store all the public keys here, the, the directory must be secure. That is, there must be no way for some user to get a public key in the directory which is someone else's public key. That is, there's no way for me to go to the directory and say, here is John's public key, where it's in fact my public key. So we need some way to secure the directory. And of course, if someone gets access to that directory the system will fail. And two, I guess, specific instances of how do we do this across a network are uh, shown in this one and in the, in the next example. So the concept is that we use some central server or some central trusted third party, some authority. In this scheme we have our set of users, in this example just A and B, and we have an authority, someone we trust. That is the users trust the public key authority. And so this is a case of a publicly available directory, but it shows the protocol for exchanging the messages to get the keys of the other user. And before these steps are performed, it assumes that each user has gone to the directory or the authority and published their key. So each user has done this step. User A has gone to the authority and said, here's my public key. And so has user B. They've gone to the authority, the directory, and said, here's my public key. So they publish their keys inside the directory or called here the authority. And also when you go to the directory, you not only publish your key, but you also obtain the public key of the directory or the authority. So before any of this happens, the set of keys known, and I think we, we covered this last week, but quickly again, the authority A and B, the authority before these steps knows the public key of A, the public key of B. The authority also has its own key pair. Public key of the authority and the private key of the authority. 
That's known by the authority before these steps. <coughs> A, of course, has its own pair. So does B, P-U-B, P-R, the private key of B. They are the key pairs. They are known by each user. And also, A knows the public key of the authority. So does B. They were obtained manually. That is, somehow user A went to the authority and, and gave them their public key and similar received the public key of the authority and they trust that. So we assume that they are trustworthy keys. We know that they in fact the, use the key of A and the key of the authority. And B has done the same. So that was some manual exchange. For example, if I was running the authority and you were the users, you would come to my office, you'd show me your ID, and I would check your ID, and then we'd exchange our public keys. I would give you mine, you would have the authority's public key, and you would give me your public key. And then these steps show what happens to, for A to communicate with B when we communicate across a network. Okay, so now there's some server and two users, two computers. A wants to communicate to B. To communicate to B, A needs B's public key. Okay, that's our goal here. A wants to find B's public key and similar because B will need to find A's public key. That's our goal of this protocol. So our initial state, the result should be that A knows PUB and B knows PUA. And when I say they know them, they must be verified. From now on, in any of these messages, an attacker could intercept a message and change it. So if we just send a public key from A to B, nothing, in, no encryption, no signature, if we just send the public key of A direct to B, there's nothing stopping a malicious user from intercepting and changing that. So we cannot rely on that. And that's why we have these set, set of six or seven steps. And the steps uh, the initiator A requests a public key from the authority. They request B's public key. So in this request, A is saying, please send me B's public key. And the authority sends back a reply containing B's public key. Some information from the request, including a timestamp so that a knows that this is a reply to their previously sent message. It's not a replay of some old message. So they can check if it's a, a replay from something that happened before. And importantly, the public key of B is signed by the authority. Encrypted using the authority's private key, in this case. And A verifies that received public key by using the public key of the authority. Anything encrypted with the private key of the authority can be verified using the public key of the authority. And since we trust the public key of the authority, A trusts the public key of B. So now A has PUB. And <coughs> step three, A sends a message encrypted using PUB so no one else can see it. Encrypted with a public key means that we provide confidentiality. Saying, I am user A. B receives this message. And B now knows, okay, A wants to communicate with me. I will need A's public key. So B requests from the authority the public key of A. The authority in step five sends back the public key of A. Again, signed by the authority. When I say signed, I mean encrypted with the private key of that user. Something signed by a user is encrypted using the private key. So step one and two, and steps four and five are similar. It's just this is requesting B's public key, and this is B requesting A's public key. And once B receives message five, they verify the message using the public key of the authority. Once they verify everything's correct, 
they now know A's public key. We've achieved our goal. Our goal was A and B know each other's public key. After step five, we've achieved that goal. Step six and seven are just some final authentication checks to make sure that message three was not a replay. So it's not about the dist distribution of the public keys. It's just to confirm that someone didn't make this message up or replay this message from before. So it's just we saw this in one of the other schemes where we do some final checks and saying, did you really send this? Yes, I really sent this. <clears throat> so the idea in this scheme is that we have two, two steps. We say the manual exchange is the public keys between user and authority. That is, before any of these exchanges, each user goes to the authority and publishes their public key and similarly receives the public key of the authority. That happens before this. So if we have 10 users, each user must go to the authority and exchange their public keys. And once that's done, when any user wants to communicate with any other user, A wants to communicate with B, then they perform these steps, these seven steps. And as a result, A gets B's public key and B gets A's public key. And if user C wants to communicate with D, then they do the same set of steps. Does the public key authority assign a public key to the users, or does the users give their public key to the public key? Does, so the question is, does, does the authority assign the public key? No. The user chooses their public key. Remember, when you generate a key with public key cryptography, you're in fact generating a pair of keys. You create your own public and private key at the same time. You did that with Diffie-Hellman, in fact. Same with RSA and other schemes. You generate a pair of keys, a key pair. So user A generates its key pair, P-U-A, P-R-A, then manually goes to the authority and gives the authority P-U-A, only the public key. There's no need for the authority to know the private key of A. Only the public key in this case. So the authority doesn't generate it, the user generates their own key pair. So first there's some manual exchange of public, public keys and then, let's say across the network, some automatic. When I say automatic, I say mean we can send these messages across the network, across an open network. The, what are the seven steps shown on this diagram. That's done via some protocol. So some software can do that and send it as messages across some network. Whereas the manual exchange, we assume that there's some other channel for exchanging public keys, like a physical exchange or some other secure channel. If there are 100 users, then each user must exchange their public key manually with the authority. And then when any pair of users want to communicate, they go through these steps. This works OK. OK, it's secure. Both users learn the public key of the other user. The problem is performance. Because whenever any user wants to communicate with another user, they must perform these steps. And in each time, there's a message to the authority from A and a response, and similar from B to the authority. So now imagine we have a network with 1,000 users. Every time any pair of users want to communicate, they both send a message to the authority. So many messages are going to the authority and the authority must respond with many messages. So ev for every pair of communications there are four messages here. So we put a lot of load on the authority in this case. The authority becomes a performance bottleneck. 
If the authority crashes, it's a server, for example, a computer running some software. If it doesn't work, it's unreachable, then the system does not work because we rely on that authority then. If it becomes slow because many messages are going to it, then it'll be slow to respond and it slows down how A and B can exchange their public keys and hence communicate. And so from a performance perspective, this can be a problem relying on that public key authority all the time. But from a security perspective, it works okay. And when, let's say today, on the current day, A communicates to B, they perform these steps. Maybe tomorrow when they want to communicate with B again, they may repeat the steps to check and get a new public key. But in fact, you can improve the performance a little bit by performing some caching, storing some old messages in that case. But generally the problem is that the authority is a performance bottleneck. Everything goes via the authority every time any two users want to communicate. So an alternative is to use generally public key certificates. So we'll go through a scheme of how to use certificates and then start to describe the, the form, formal parts of what do we mean by a certificate. So here's a, a different approach. And we have these two users, A and B, want to communicate, and an authority. Here we call it a certificate authority. We'll see that we use this concept, but we call the things that we exchange a certificate, and we'll describe what they mean. But here's our central authority, and the same as the public key authority, but it has a slightly different role. Here we're showing the, let's say, the manual step of exchanging a public key with the authority. So don't be confused by comparing this diagram with the previous one. In this case, we only showed the automatic steps. We didn't show the manual exchange. In fact, the manual exchange is like this. Whereas in this diagram, we're showing both. This is one of the, or this is the manual exchange. This happens before we do anything automatically across the network. And then, so, so is this between A and the authority. The automatic steps are just one and two. Okay, so if we compare to the previous case, the manual steps, we do something before we exchange across the network. Uh, these two messages and these two. The automatic, just these two steps. Okay. So, first thing we do is before we want to communicate with other users, each user, similar as before, publishes a public key to the authority. That's the same as before. We go to the authority and say, here's my public key. So, again, A has its key pair. B has its own key pair. And we'll see also the authority has a key pair. What do we call it here? Same as before. Each user has a key pair. They generate their own pair of public and private key. And then <coughs> user A goes to the authority and says, here's my public key. And the authority will check the identity for example, if I'm the authority, you as the user will come to me and say, here's my public key, I'll check your ID and confirm this is actually you. 
So that's a manual step. So the authority learns the public key of user A. And what the authority does is they issue a certificate to user A conf with the public key of user A. And that's this second step here. This is a certificate, or a simple form of a certificate for user A, CA. What a certificate contains, importantly, is the public key of a user signed by someone else, where that someone else is the authority, someone will trust. So we see that this, in, in the shortened form, is the public key of A, we include the identity of A, say the name of user A, it's usually some timestamp saying that this is valid from this date onwards, and it's signed by the authority, encrypted using the private key of the authority. So this is issued to user A. So user A, we say, now has C A. Which is just its own public key, but it's signed by the authority. That's the manual exchange. So each user is issued with a certificate from some authority. And again, as with before, we trust the authority. B does the same. So the result is that the authority will have the public key of B, and B will be issued with its own certificate. And at the same time, although it's not shown here, a will learn the public key of the authority. And so will B. So that's the, the knowledge from the manual exchange. So that's what we assume when the, before we start sending packets across the network. Which is these two steps and these two steps. That's part of the manual exchange. Similar to before, A knows its own key pair as well as the authority's public key. The authority knows its own key pair as well as the other user's public key. So that's the same as we had before. In addition, each user has their own certificate. What's our goal here? What are we trying to achieve? From now on, what are we trying to do? Same as with the public key authority, what's our goal? It's nice that we've got some new, new students finally arrive at the end of the semester, so we'll ask them some questions later. Uh, what's the goal with this, with, it, with this exchange? What are we trying to do? Uh, identify um, what are we trying to exchange? Public keys. All we're trying to do is A wants to know B's public key and B wants to know A's, A's public key so that they can communicate using those keys. That's the same as what we were trying to do in this case. Just exchange each other's public key. In the previous case using the authority, after the manual setup, to exchange the public keys, we perform these seven steps. Using a certificate authority, we've done the manual ste steps. To now, to obtain a public key, we perform just these two steps. All we do is we send each other our own certificate. A sends CA to B, B sends CB back to A. So, and that's done across the network. So we send it in some message across the public internet, for example. So the result after that exchange is that A knows CB and B knows CA. Remember the goal is for A to know PUB, the public key of B, and for B to know the public key of A. That's the goal. Have we reached that goal yet? Have we reached the goal? 
We have the certificate. We want to know the public key. But what is the certificate? Let's look at it here. Let's write it down. CB, for example, is encrypt using the private key of the authority some timestamp, the current time, the identity of a user, IDB, like the name of the user, and the public key of B. That's CB as on the on the slide. A knows CB first. Can they decrypt this? Can A decrypt this? Hands up for yes. Higher. Anyone else? Hands up for yes. Can A decrypt? Maybe this will be our quiz, our quiz that we need to have. We'll have a quiz today and it will be made up of a set of questions. Yes or no. Can A decrypt CB? Yes. yes. Okay, enough people responded yes. What about no? Anyone? Of course A can decrypt it because it's encrypted with the private key of the authority and A has the public key of the authority. Okay. In fact, we say it's signed by the authority and we don't talk, generally talk about encrypting and decrypting. We say if it's signed by the authority, we can verify it if we have the public key of the authority. And we do have the public key of the authority and we trust that public key because that was obtained in the manual exchange at the start. Anything obtained in that manual exchange, we trust. Because someone came to my office, they showed me the ID, we trust each other, and you obtained the public key of the authority. So first, user A can decrypt this, or they can verify it, and therefore they can see the contents. What are the, the contents? Some timestamp, some identity, some name, and importantly, the public key of B. So when you have someone's certificate, you also have their public key. So in fact, A does have the public key of B. And importantly, they are certain it is B's public key because it was signed by the authority. And we trust anything signed by the authority because we trust the authority's public key. So A knows B's public key and similar B knows A's public key. So a certificate contains the public key as well as some other things. And importantly, that public key is verified or is signed by some other user. In this case, the certificate authority. So we've achieved our goal. A and B know each other's public key. And they are sure they are the correct user's public key because they were signed by the authority. And we trust the authority. So in summary, in this approach, there's these four steps in the manual exchange at the start. Every user must go to the authority and be issued a certificate. If there are a thousand users, that happens a thousand times. And then whenever any two users want to communicate, A wants to send data to B, then those two users just exchange their certificates. And from a performance perspective, that's much better than using the public key of authority. In the public key authority, whenever any two users want to communicate, they go to the authority, receive a response, exchange some messages, and B also goes to the authority. Whereas with a certificate, the authority is not involved. It's just A to B when we do the automatic exchange across the network. So from a performance perspective in a large network, this is much better. Same level of security. Both cases, the end goal of each user knowing the public key of the other user is achieved. So the same level of security, but better performance in this case. Especially in large networks. And certificates 
public key certificates. Uh, the primary form for distributing public keys in the internet today. So when you access a website using HTTPS, and I'll show some examples today, you receive a certificate from that website which has been issued by some authority. And your browser verifies the certificate that you receive to check that you're contacting the website that you think you're contacting. So we'll see some examples of how your browser does that. So they're important in how we use public key cryptography in the internet. Once a user has a certificate issued to them, they can just tell anyone what that certificate is. Just send it to them across an open network. Because importantly, that certificate contains the public key of the user signed by the authority. So long as the other user trusts the authority, then we can receive the public key. So when comparing certificates versus the public key authority, same level of security, different in terms of performance. So now let's look at the details of certificates. So, so the assumption is, in, in general, that the users have the public key of the authority. So then if you think about your web browser, your web browser, you're the user and the web browser is the user. If we receive a certificate from a web server, we need to verify that certificate with the public key of an authority. So if there was one authority in the world, then every user must have the certificate of that authority in your web browser. It turns out that doesn't scale very well, just having one authority in the whole world and every web browser getting a certificate from there, because who, the issuing of certificates also takes effort. It turns out we have a hierarchy of authorities, not just one authority, but many authorities. And we'll see the details of that there's a few slides towards the end here and also in a demo with looking at our browser. So it turns out you don't need just one authority, you can have multiple authorities for performance reasons. In this, in this example scheme, the certificate is shown as take the public key of the user, some identity. When I say ID, the identity, it depends upon the context or the scenario. It could be a name of a user, it could be an address of a computer, but it's something that identifies that user in the system. T, a timestamp, usually, in fact we'll see later, we, usually two times. The time in which this certificate starts to be valid and when it finishes being valid. Okay, so this certificate is valid from today until one year from today. So in, fa in practice we'll see there's usually two times. But in this example we say in general we need some timestamp to indicate how long the certificate is valid for. So the certificate was encrypted using the private key of the authority. This is the general concept. We need to have a public key signed by the authority. How do we, so this is a general concept of a certificate. The specific format, there are different options. The most common format is defined in a standard called X509. And that's what's commonly used in the internet today. So we'll look at the details of that format. It's used in many internet protocols that are used uh, for security today. Whenever you access a, a secure website using HTTPS, there's a certificate involved. So let's look at the content of these specific X509 format. So an authority issues or 
the user selects their own public key, but the authority creates a certificate. They issue a certificate. And the certificates can be stored in some public directory. They can be published on websites because when you receive a certificate, you can confirm that it's valid by using the authority's public key. What does the X509 format contain? This information we'll see in detail. The version of the format that we're using, it's been improved over time. We'll see that oh, the algorithm used for signing, that is here we say E, encrypt using the private key of the authority. What algorithm is used there? And in fact, we normally do not just encrypt using a public key algorithm, we normally take the hash of the contents and encrypt just the hash of the contents. So we'll see that in detail. And we'll explain why. Some identity of the authority. Some time frame for which this certificate is valid. For example, it's valid from today until one month from now or one year from now. And after that time frame, you shouldn't trust the certificate. The name or identity of the user, the public key of the user, and the signature. So in fact, in the general approach is we encrypt this information with the private key. We'll see with X509, it's slightly more than that. It's illustrated here in the diagram where we have Bob's certificate. We have his ID, something that identifies Bob, his name, some un unique identifier. Bob's public key, so the value of his public key. And some information about who the authority is, the CA, the name of the authority. And we take that information and that will be part of the certificate, that will be included, but we also take a hash of that. So we use a hash algorithm, MD5, SHA1, some other hash algorithm, and we take a hash of all that information and we get some hash value, some fixed length, small value, and we encrypt the hash value using the private key of the authority. So this is the signature phase. In fact, in practice, we do not encrypt the entire content. We just encrypt a hash of the content. We take the content, take a hash value, encrypt using the private key of the authority of that hash value. And as a result, we get the signature. And we attach that signature to the rest of the content. And together, the content plus the signature is the certificate and we can send that across the network, publish that anywhere we like. When we send it to someone, they need to verify to check that it's valid. What they do is that they take the signed part, the signature part here, and decrypt using a public key of the authority. This part was created by taking a hash value and encrypting with the private key of the authority Therefore, we take that value and decrypt with the public key of the authority. And we should get the hash value back. And then we take the content and calculate a hash of the content and we compare these two values. If they're the same, we trust the certificate. If they're different, we don't trust it. So we're using the concepts that we've seen in some of the other topics of taking a hash of the value, signing, and so on. So this is the signing part. We create a certificate by signing it. This is the verification part. We check if it's valid. That's the general procedure. Let's look in some more detail of what is actually inside the X509 format. What's the content? It contains a set of fields, our certificate. The version of the protocol or the, the standard we're using, X509, has different versions. Some unique number given to this certificate. So your certificate will have a serial number. Mine will have a different serial number. So it can be just some uh, 
long random number. Some details about the algorithm used for signing. Remember the signing, there's two parts of the algorithm. We take a hash and then we encrypt. So we must specify what is the hash algorithm used and what is the encryption algorithm used and what parameters do we use for those. So for example, the signing algorithm could be use SHA-1 as the hash function and use RSA as the encrypt function. So what specific function do we use in those cases? They are listed inside the certificate. The name of the issuer, this is the authority. So the authority has some name, some identity. The two, two dates or times for when this certificate is valid. So it's not valid before some time and it's not valid after some time. So two timestamps or dates. The name of the user, the subject it's called formally. So if it's my certif certificate, my name would be here. And in fact, it's not just the name, usually it's a, a they call a common name, an organisation name, for example, School of ICT, SIT, Thomas Hart University. So it can be more than just a, an individual person's name. So the name of the user, the subject, the public key of the user or subject. So what is your public key? The algorithm used for the public key, any parameters, and the actual key is included here. So if we use RSA, the key would, would contain what values? In RSA, what's the key? Or what are the variables we use to denote the key? RSA, you're thinking of Diffie-Hellman. Remember RSA when we, what's the public key? What are we, the letters we use? E and N. Remember with RSA, N is the modulus, mod N. So that's part of the public key. And the other value is this value E, the exponent that we use. So the value of E and N is included here. If we're using Diffie-Hellman, then we have the, the public values Y and the parameters, the alpha and, uh, and Q in Diffie-Hellman. We have some unique ID, some long unique ID for the authority and the user, the issuer and the subject. We may include some optional extensions to give in more information, but not, uh, we're not going to cover that. And then finally, the last part is the actual signature. So we take all of this above, we use the hash algorithm to find the hash value and then we encrypt with the authority or the issuer's private key and the result is the signature. That's our certificate. Let's have a look at some examples. So one place where we use certificates a lot is on secure web access. So when you access a site using HTTPS, the issue is that with HTTPS we want to encrypt the information between your browser and the web server so that no one in between can intercept and see the information. For example, the web server for your bank. So between the browser and the server we want to encrypt the information. So why do we need a public key? Well, we can use a public key to verify that we're communicating with the bank and we can use that public key to encrypt a secret key and then use that secret, tea, secret key to encrypt our information. So we need the public key of the server. So if I find the public key of the server, then I can choose a secret key and encrypt that secret key and send it to the server and then our data can be encrypted with that secret key. So 
when I access a secure website, the normal procedure is that I obtain the certificate of that website. Let's have a look at the certificates. The exact protocol for doing it we'll see in a later topic. Okay. But let's just look at the co content of the certificate. So let's access some secure websites. And we'll give two examples. Uh, so here's one of, one of my websites and in the HTTPS to indicate I want to use a secure connection between my browser on this computer and my server somewhere else and it connects fine and note in this case Firefox shows this padlock up here giving some indication that there's some form of security what's it say when I hover over it says verified by Startcom if we click on it it gives me some information you are connected to a particular domain name sandylands.info so it's confirming, and we'll see later, the certificate is coming from this dom domain name, which is run by unknown, so there's n no information about who the owner of this is, but it's coming from a particular domain name, and it's verified by Startcom, some other company. So in this case, and we'll see the details, this, is a, this information is coming from a certificate for sandylands.info, where the authority is Startcom. And it says your connection to this website is encrypted to prevent eavesdropping, which means that we've used this certificate to then exchange some secret key and then everything we send between the browser and the website is encrypted. Let's look at some more information. So some more information about that connection and Actually, before we look at it, some identity of the website. So it gives, uses the domain name to identify it. And the, in this case, the owner, the website doesn't supply ownership information. It's just the domain name that identifies it. The owner, it could be someone's name, it could be my name, but it's not in this case. And the verified by is the authority in this case. And we can actually view the certificate. Before we do it, we see down the bottom some other information about the security. The connection between the browser, Firefox, and the server is encrypted using AES 256, 256-bit key. And it's just some information about that. Now let's look at that actual certificate. And Firefox shows some general summary information, but let's look at the well, let's look at that first and then go into the details. So this just shows a selection of the information. The, the name of the subject, who this certificate is issued to, is in fact broken into different fields. There's a common name, the domain name of the website, and optionally can be an organisation or organisation unit. For example, it could be a common name of SIT and the organization is SIT, the unit is the School of ICT or something similar. So you can identify the organization as well. Some serial number, that is given for that, the subject, the user in this case. And then issued by is the authority who issued this certificate and some common name for the uh, authority, Startcom Class 1 Primary Intermediate Server CA and some organisation name. Issued on 11th of June 2012, expires on 11th of June 2013. So this is valid for one year, this certificate. After 11th of June 2013, when your browser receives this, even though the signature may verify, it should also check the expiry date and if the date is past this it shouldn't accept this certificate it's no longer considered valid and the fingerprints are used for the the signature let's look into some some of the details 
So this is the actual fields in, inside the certificate. So I'll select the field here and we see the value here. It's, I know it's small, but we can just make out. So the version of X509 being used in this case is version 3. The serial number for this certificate, which was created by the issuer when the certificate was created. The algorithm used to sign, and remember with the algorithm, with signing there are two parts, the hash and the public key cryptography. So this is using SHA-1 and RSA encryption. So you can use different algorithms. You're not fixed to a particular algorithm. You can use SHA-256, SHA-5112, different algorithms here. You can use RSA, DSA, other public key algorithms. Then the issuer, that's the authority, and it's broken into four fields. Uh, common name, organization, unit, organization, country. And the two dates, it's not valid before this date and time, and not after this date and time. And the subject is who the user is. It's got an email address, a common name, and a country. Not all fields ne are needed in the certificate. Uh, I think this object identifies just some um, some encoding of the information included there. It would depend upon what fields are included. So that identifies the user or the subject. Then we have the public key info. This is the public key of the user, the subject. What algorithm is used for the public key? And here we again, again use RSA. It doesn't have to be the same as the signature. The public key here is chosen by the user. They choose whatever algorithm they like. RSA, DSA, some other algorithm. The signing is done by the issuer or the authority. Again, they choose whatever algorithm they like. So they may be different. It's just they're the same in this case. Both use RSA because RSA is very common. And here's the public key. And you can see the modulus, which is N in the public key. 4096 bits is the size of N in this case. And if we scroll down, it's presented in hexadecimal. And E, the exponent. And here, E is just 65537. So it's a very common value of E. With RSA, the value of E, the exponent, is usually this value or some other well-known value. It doesn't have to be different, but the modulus n must be different. So there's the public key. Extensions, we will not go through them. You may include some other information. Signature algorithm and importantly the signature itself. That's it. That is, we take the hash of all the other information and then encrypt it with RSA. If we write down the entire certificate, we started with a version, then we had some other information, the issuer, subject, so all the other fields, we take all of them, combine them together, all of this, what we just went through, and then at the bottom we attach the signature or the end, we attach the signature, which is we take the hash 
of all of this and then encrypt and in this case we encrypt with the private key of the authority we take the hash of all the, the information encrypt with the private key of the authority in our case the hash function is SHA1 and the encrypt function is RSA and this value here, the signature, is the output of this the hash, the SHA1 of all this information, the previous fields and then encrypted with the private key of the issuer, start com in this case and we get this 2048 bit value as an output so that's the signature, so we that's the in entire certificate for this this website a web server so when the server sends me this certificate sends my browser this certificate how do I verify it? how do I know it's valid what do I do I decrypt decrypt the signature with the public key of of the authority and the authority in this example it was start.com let's scroll up just remind us the issuer the company is called start.com so I decrypt with the public key of this organization where is that public key did you did I encrypt it decrypt it when I use my browser does the user have to do it no it should be automatic Where's the public key of Startcom? So to verify this certificate, it was signed with the private key of Startcom. To verify, I use the public key of Startcom. Therefore, I need to know the public key of Startcom. Where is that? No, that's the value of E. Where is the public key of the issuer in this case? It's not in the, the certificate. The certificate contains the server's public key. In here was the, the public key of the server. Where's the public key of the issuer? Again the browser knows it. It's pre-configured in the browser. So when you access a web server, that web server sends you its certificate, you need to verify it. Or your browser needs to verify it. To do that, your browser needs to know the public key of the authority. And a common way that that's performed is your browser is pre-configured with a set of public keys of authorities and in fact not just public keys of authorities but certificates of authorities trusted certificates let's have a look why won't you close wrong button so now let's look at that was the certificate of the web server that my browser received to verify and you can see it in Firefox under preferences here I'm under advanced encryption and I can view certificates and there are a number of tab, tabs up the top the one I've selected is authorities these are at least most of these uh, came when I installed Firefox. These are a set of certificates of different authorities that my browser trusts. And inside those certificates are the public keys of those authorities. So we must start with some public keys to be able to verify something that we receive. So there's a bunch of authorities that my browser trusts. Some of them you'll recognize their names. Some are companies, uh, government organizations. Uh, 
Komodo is a, a large security company. DigiCert uh, and Trust is another large one. Let's, but we, our certificate was signed or issued by Startcom. Let's see if we can find them. Okay. And was it this one, I think? The certificate, the issuer was Startcom, and I can't remember if it was class one or class two, but one of these two. So there are multiple certificates for this organization. So we can actually view that certificate as well. And it's the same format. So let's make note of what we've got so far. My browser received My browser received a certificate for sandylands.info. That was the website I contacted. And I'll write it as that's the user or the subject. And the issuer was Startcom. And specifically, I think it referred to Startcom class two primary intermediate server. That was the issuer in that case. The, the public key of that user is needed to verify. So now I go into my browser and I see the set of certificates I already know about and trust. So these authorities are the authorities my browser trusts. And I find this certificate here for Startcom class two, so Startcom summarized class two. This notation is just shorthand to say that this is the user, this is the authority. Certificate for sandylands.info signed by Startcom class two. And now we see this certificate for Startcom class 2. Who's the issuer? Who signed it? Well, at least here, the issued by, in this case, Startcom certificate or certification authority. So this certificate is signed by someone else. Same company, but a different certificate. CA, let's call it. And we could check the details in here. It has a, a, a validity. So now let's see whether we trust who signed this. Because to verify this first certificate I received, I need the public key of this organization. Well, the public key is inside here. But this public key is being signed by Startcom CA. And we also see in my browser, in fact, I trust the, that certific certificate already, but let's just check. Startcom CA is a built-in object. It's already in my browser. So, to be complete, we have a third certificate, Startcom CA. And if we looked at the details, who signed this? Who, look at the, the subject, issued to, and the authority issued by. I know it's hard to see at the back. It's the same organization. Startcom Certification Authority, Startcom Certification Authority. This is a special case certificate, what we'd say self-signed. The same person who, whose public key is included issued or signed that. Startcom CA. 
we'll return to that a bit later, self-signed certificates, but coming back to the start. My browser received this certificate. I want to check if the public key of sandylands.info is valid. To do so, I need the public key of Startcom class 2. And I look in the set of trusted certificates inside my browser for the certificate of Startcom class 2, and I find it there. And therefore, I trust the public key of that organization. I use the public key of Startcom class 2 to verify the received certificate. And if it verifies, then I trust the public key now of sandylands.info. And then I can use that public key to encrypt information between my browser and the server. So important point here. For this to work in practice, your browser must be pre-configured with a set of certificate authorities. And we see in here, most common browsers have a large list of different authorities different companies and government organizations. VeriSign is another large one. And in fact, there may be different authority certificates. Visa, uh, you'll see Microsoft and other organizations in there. If you don't trust this organization or this certificate, then you need to remove it from your browser. And now that I trust the public key of sandylands.info, I can encrypt a secret key to use for our data encryption. Any questions on the concept so far of certificates? So remember, it contains a public key of user. My certificate contains my public key. But importantly, it is signed by some authority. And when someone receives my certificate, they need to verify it. And to verify it, they need the public key of the authority. And, OK, yeah? Uh, why, why the authority can sell side itself? But when I sell side, yeah. So the question about, in this last case, we had a certificate signed by the same organization as it's issued to which is called a self-signed certificate. So long as the browser accepts that, so the, the, the list of certificates here on this authorities tab are the ones that your browser trusts. So if there's a certificate in this list, then your browser will trust and use the public key from that list. But if we'll see later a case of a self-signed that's not trusted, we'll come back to that one. Okay, after the break, you'll be happy to answer some quiz questions about certificates. Make sure you remember, contains a public key. Certificate contains a public key, plus other information, but importantly, a public key of the user, and it's signed by an authority, and to verify it, we need the public key of the authority. And it turns out, later we'll see we can have a chain of certificates. That is, we could consider these as a chain of certificates in that here's one public key signed by one authority and that authority's public key is signed by another authority and that authority's public key is signed, in this case, signed by itself. We can actually have a chain of certificates, but we'll cover that after the break. Let's stop there and then we'll try and demonstrate with some examples, different aspects of certificates after the break. If we, okay, let's have a quick example. If we, what, it, what will happen if we access a website and we, we receive a certificate, but there's no Startcom class 2? for example, in there. Let's try. Let's visit the IT server. HTTPS IT.SIT. I think I have to re reload. Sorry, my internet's gone. Let's try again. Maybe.
it was working at the start of the lecture. Let's do that and show you after the, the break, okay? Let's have a break and we'll see if we can get some internet access and I'll show you the case what happens if we don't trust the certificate, okay? Let's continue later. See what's wrong. <laughs> 